Legend, Icon, the industry standard for over 40 years. The Shure SM58 professional vocal microphone could certainly coast on its reputation. But this is one legend whose story is still being written. Night after night, stage after stage, session after session. There's a reason the SM58 continues to be used, abused, trusted, and beloved by music industry giants the world over. In fact, there are a lot of reasons. It starts with the technology. Shure invented it and continues to perfect it. Every unidirectional dynamic microphone that's followed the SM58 utilizes the same core components, but only the SM58 is hand assembled to Shure's rigorous specifications. Its bass roll off and brighten mid range help your voice cut through the mix. A consistent cardioid polar pattern minimizes background noise and reduces the possibility of feedback. And its custom designed pneumatic shock mount virtually eliminates stage vibration and handling noise. So the only thing that comes through the SM58 is your voice, clear and true. But sound quality is only part of the SM58 story. Its tank-like toughness is the stuff to make roadies wax poetic. Built to military specs, the SM58 has been subjected to the sort of abuse that'll make Armageddon seem like just another day at the office. And it always keeps performing. It may end up with a dented grill, but that's by design. The grill acts as a crumple zone, protecting the cartridge inside without affecting the sound. And dented grills can always be replaced, or brandished with pride, like old battle scars. It's no wonder countless artists from across the musical landscape, from up-and-comers to bona fide superstars, trust one mic and one mic only. It's no wonder the legend of the SM58 just keeps on growing. For more information, visit Shure.com. Hello, everyone, and happy SM58 Day. On behalf, of, on behalf of everyone at Sure, we'd like to welcome you to our live stream celebration. My name is Ryan Smith, Regional Manager of our Nashville Artist Relations Office and part of our Pro Audio team. Just one of your hosts for today. Most everyone is familiar with the iconic SM58. It's been on stages for over five decades, as well as churches, schools, recording studios, podcasts, and for live streams. Today, we celebrate the product that continues to have such a positive influence on so many lives, and we thank you for joining us. We've got lots in store for you today, including a wonderful group of special guests, longtime Sure artist Henry Rollins, as well as Rascal Flats engineers John Loser and Stuart Delk. We're going to dive into some of the amazing history behind the SM58, and by way of our company historian, Michael Pedersen, as well as detailed product info about the world's most popular vocal microphone from John Bourne in product management. Finally, we're going to give away 10 regular SM58s, as well as four of our limited edition 50th anniversary 58s to random winners throughout our event. Just a few items before we get started. We are all coming to you via our homes and respective internet connections. If we have any technical difficulties, please stand by and we'll get them worked out. Now I'm going to kick it over to Jason Waffle, part of our pro audio team, to hand out the first set of 58s. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you all for being here on our uh, Sure Holiday SM58 day. We appreciate you joining us. Um, so without further ado, I think we're going to kick off the opening portion of this. We're going to give away some microphones, which is what some of you guys are here for. Uh, we have our first drawing right now. Uh, that's going to be for three SM58s. Uh, we're going to give, a, give away three more after the first segment with Henry, um, uh, four more after that. And at the very end, we're going to give away four uh, 50th anniversary SM58s. So for those of you that entered, there'll be some giveaways throughout. I'll be hopping in to give those away. So. Uh, let's kick this thing off with our first three randomly selected winners. Uh, number one for the SM58 winner is Michael Hernandez out of Escondido, California. Congratulations, Michael. Uh, the second person is going to be Joe Bidens from Orlando, Florida. And our third winner of our first drawing is Joanna Van Loon from Downers Grove, Illinois. Uh, we will be reaching out to you via email to uh, figure out how to get that SM58 to you. Uh, congratulations to our first round of winners. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, and we're going to kick it over to Corey Lorenz now, who's uh, going to interview our first special guest, Mr. Henry Rollins. Congratulations hey, again. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, man. Daughters Grove, Illinois, represent. All right. Absolutely. 
Not too far, not too far from the Sure Factory. Congrats, everybody. So yeah, I'm gonna bring in uh, our special guest, Mr. Henry Rollins. Um, Henry, are you there, sir? Uh, hopefully, there yeah. Can you see? There me? he you is. See? Yeah. Hey. I How did are it, you, sir. You I'm did good. it. <laughs> I can apologize to everyone because I I, I, don't, I don't have the tech savvy to actually use an SM58 into my laptop, but I can fake it. There I can you go. Talk. Oh. I can talk into one. <laughs> it's wireless. Your yeah, first wireless really 58. Wireless. Yes. Perfect. So, Henry, thanks again for joining us. I, I, I can imagine this has been kind of a weird thing for you. You're usually a man on the go. You're usually home for maybe like a week, once a year. And yeah, and now just, you're. Just yeah, I've, I've a lot of trips I was going to take have canceled. Last yeah. month, I was supposed to be in London to work on some BBC uh, radio stuff gone two different festival dates in germany this year gone at the end of this month i was supposed to be in uganda that's not going to happen uh australia in august to host a festival not going to happen and i have a trip for uh the falkland islands south georgia island and antarctica for november december and so far that's still holding otherwise i don't know if i have tour dates next year i don't mm. I don't have any tour dates this year. I mean, they all went away. And so um, there are there are some moments where it's, uh, you know, the mind can make you pretty worried. Yeah, definitely. So you've been you've been working on a book. I think you've been you've been talking to me about that. You've but, been yeah, about 12 moment, to so. 14 hours a day uh, of sitting <laughs> down, uh, staring at a manuscript I'm trying to breathe life into. Yeah, it'll be out in December. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Looking forward to it. So, yeah, let's dive in. I mean, you and I have talked about this this wonderful microphone, the 58, many times. So let's, let's talk about, for, for our viewers out there, let's talk about your relationship with the 58. How, how did that all begin for you? Well, I started doing music as someone on a stage in 1980. And in those days, I was, I was 19. I, I didn't know anything about audio, really. And I, someone just put a mic in my hand. And I'm, I'm sure it was a 58. I, I had no idea what any of that meant. Just give me a mic and turn me loose. Soon after, I was in a band called Black Flag. And that was the summer of 1981. And that's when gear became the thing. And you started learning there's a great difference in everything from amplifiers, guitars, drums, drum heads, and microphones, especially for someone who's going to be sweating profusely from his face into a microphone, like a faucet. I don't break gear, but I will rust out a diaphragm. You know, I will ruin the inside of a mic from sheer perspiration. And so suddenly I've got a 58 in my hand, five hours a day for band practice, and then almost every single night on the road. And you realize very quickly what works, and what doesn't work. And I'm not going to mention any other brands. It's not fair. They're not here to defend themselves. But um, it's 1984 or so, my 58 burned out. We couldn't find another. And we went to a music store and bought some other brand's version. And it lasted, had nice mid-range. It lasted two gigs. And because of the perspiration factor, it just went away. And I literally gave it to our sound man. I said, take it. And, you know, he, I don't know what he did with it. And so I realized the 58 is my mic. And that was the beginning of me having a 58 by choice in my hand band. And dig this. I've made a bunch of music records, right? I have never used anything else. And I've made a lot of records. I'm not trying to impress you. I'm just saying, you know, I, I was at it for quite a while. I used a, a Sure 58. For any record you've ever heard me on with a band, I, I had a 58. And engineers are saying like, whoa, what are you thinking? I'm like, you're not going to understand how I sound unless I'm doing it with a 58 because I won't be able to hear myself in the headphones unless it's a 58. It'll sound like someone else and I can't, I can't hit it. And they, you know, good naturedly, well, here, we'll, we'll stand you in front of this mic stand. I'm like, I can't. And so... Every like Black Flag, Rollins Band, whatever, 58 was in my hand to make those records. Awesome. And I, I think over the years, you, you did try other Sure microphones and, and, and 
And maybe so much wasn't the durability, but different characteristics of those microphones just didn't pan yeah, out for you. Years ago, Sure sent me the prototype for the 58 Beta, which was I was very excited by. And I think that might be for someone who can actually sing, where they're not hitting the mic necessarily with so much input and is grabbing more information, where I have kind of on and off, like cement mixer on, cement mixer off. And so I used a Beta, we brought one out on tour and we tried it at sound check and the gain structure, it just wasn't, I mean, it's a great mic. It just wasn't great for what I was doing. And so we, we said, I think we sent it back because I, I don't want to keep anything I'm not going to use. And so I, I think I sent it back to you guys, I think the early nineties, whenever, whenever the, the beta got tested and I tried the one uh, that beautiful with a slim handle that uses phantom power. Beta 87. Beta okay. 87. Yeah, yeah. And it, it just didn't <clears throat> sound like me. And that's when I realized I only understand how I sound in headphones or through a PA with a 58, where those microphones could be just fine. But I don't understand how I sound unless I'm going through a 58. And so luckily, the 58 is the best rock and roll, you know, carry your mic on the road mic there is. And I happen to get used to hearing myself through that mic. And so I lucked out basically, because I could have perhaps found something else and gotten used to that. Right. Um, but I have used other mics. You know, now and then you do a, you're on a show or something and they hand you a mic. And um, no. I, no. I sang the Black Flag <laughs> song with Cindy Lauper last December. That happened. You can look it up. And I think when I, think I, I might have seen to that. band practice the, the two nights before. Oh, it's pretty cool. When <laughs> I, I was in disbelief. Anyway, I walked in. <laughs> Marilyn Manson was just finishing, so we high fived on the on the way out, and they already had a fifty eight waiting for me. Because they knew, mm -hmm. but I already I had brought my own. I was like, "Oh, okay." And Perfect. So the the word has gotten around. Yeah, I guess so. So uh, the fifty eight as a tool, Henry. I mean, let's talk about. I mean, a lot of a lot of singers get used to uh, the feel, like the weight, like this is like a wrench in your hand, and yeah. and the shape of the grill and the color and all that. How important is that to you, especially like say the shape of the grill and and the weight of that mic? Does that also play a role for you? Absolutely, because a microphone is an instrument. And when I'm on stage talking, I do a lot of comedic stuff for like, you know, this kind of voice, this kind of voice. That mic, if you get on top of it, it sounds one way. If you come on the side of it, it sounds another. And so I've actually learned to involuntarily know how to aim that mic in front of me, like I'm playing an instrument, like I'm playing a theremin where it's about motion. So I will, through the night, be moving the microphone to get this voice or this voice. And I don't even know I'm doing it, but I've developed mic technique because the mic is very, uh, it's super dynamic. And so it is an instrument for me because I'm trying to use dynamics when I'm talking for two hours at a time at a rapid pace. There is actually a whole thing that I'm trying to do. And the microphone is super responsive to that. And... I would be afraid to take a different mic out for fear of being on stage and not being able to do that thing I needed to do in front of 1500 people. And so where it looks like a thing you could pound nails with, don't try it. Um, it is actually quite a dynamic and um, nimble object. Um, but the build, it's built for people who can't have things fail like touring musicians. And so you can drop it, I don't, but it can take it. And the grill, you know, if it gets pounded somehow, you can take something and push it back out again. So it's it's built by pros <clears throat> and that's enjoyable because these days, quite often things are built to break so you have to buy them again. The 58 is built to just take a beating. You know, don't beat it, be nice to it. But it's it's really built for people who go out every night. And so I appreciate that because quite often things are built by people in safe places for people who actually have to go out into the front lines 
and actually use the damn thing. And so it's the 58 has a bill like people wrote a lot of letters like I need this, this, this and this and sure went, OK, here's your mic. And the 58 responds beautifully to every demand I've ever put on it, which is for me just sheer durability because uh, I'm not hitting it or trashing it. Um, but right. I do use it like 250 times <clears throat> a year. Right. Okay, so let's talk about a little characteristic that, that you shared with me over the years. In fact, you gave me a 58 that you used for over 700 shows that finally just it just yeah. died. Uh, and, 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 yeah, yeah. And you you weren't ready to give it to me until you worked a, a, a dent in the, new, in the grill of the new microphone. Well, let's talk about that. Where did that all come from? Okay. Um, I, I had one, one of my 58 balls had a dent in it. And I think it was from my thumb and, you know, fear of failure, you squeezing the mic for dear life. And it actually became a sweet spot. Like where I, I just knew if I have that staring at me, I know every angle of the mic. And so I would start putting that dent in every 58 ball I had to aim. So I didn't have to, where is it? I'm like, it's right there. And if the mic slipped, I could move it back. And so I think that 58 ball that I was going to send you was like the prototype. <laughs> I had to like emulate it because I actually use it as a tool. And I, so I, I just basically needed it for working purposes. So I right, had to. Right, it was, the, it was the model, yeah. <laughs> That's hey, cool. Can we tell them about our running joke that you actually made true? What's that? And, oh, yeah, 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 absolutely, okay. yeah. We're, we're going to talk, we're going to talk about that. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. Oh, okay, cool, cool. Yeah, 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 I'll for sure. So I wanted to talk about um, live use. So uh, you using a 58 when you're singing Black Flag Rollins Band and you using a 58 while you're talking. What's the difference there? What what kind of damage happens between the two gigs? Uh, How long did the mics last? The, the, the music was always a perspiration thing because it's a, a very physical, my idea of a front man or a front person is it's just got to be super physical. That was my idea. I mean, it's, I'm not trying to tell anyone what to do. And from that came a lot of sweat, like a couple of pounds of water lost per night where there's like a lake of my DNA around me on a stage I leave. And a lot of that would go into the microphone. And so many years ago, we had to figure out how to deal with that. And so I, we have lines in the set list. Every like four songs, mic change. And either monitor guy would come out and I'd switch out or there'd be one waiting for me between the two front monitors. I put one down and pick up the next one. And that the first mic was taken away, dried, ball comes off, diaphragm is manually dried, hit with a hairdryer after the show. When those mics start to lose mid-range integrity because of sodium, sweat they would go back to sure a new diaphragm would be put on and they'd be coated green tape red tape so we hit them with red tape send them back to you guys you guys would recon recondition them and fedex them out to us and we would tag them with green tape and so for like a, a tour that lasts eight to 13 months there'd be th two to four 58s constantly in going to you guys to reconfigure to send back out to us so we would be playing fedex tag with you guys multi-continents um over and over in fact we would tap our australian sure rep who would have something ready for us when we got there the talking shows i do on my own where i'm just up there like you know stand up there's really no sweat going into the microphone there's uh, more distance uh and there's like no sweat whatsoever and so that's a microphone that can last me years and years. And my road manager is also my front of house sound man. He's a total audio ace. He makes the call on when it's time to tap you for a new mic because he'll go, nope, mid range is gone. And we always travel with two, the one I'm working with every night and our spare. And then I guess um, Ward gets on the phone with you and you guys arrange something. So we get another spare. And that's why I, I only come to you every several years. So you say, hey, you need anything? I'm like, no, because shirts don't break down and I don't break them. So 
you know, you, you kindly asked me if I need anything. I'm like, no, man. Yeah, long, long, quite a difference from the from the singing days where you're going through mics. However, yeah. the one technique I see you still do, and I think you did this in the Rollins band stuff from Black Flag, grab the mic, wrap the cord around your hand. Yeah. Where'd that come from? And that's it, also probably why it'll never go wireless. Well, no, I just, I, I just need that. I, I need that cord. I, I'm just, it's what I'm used to. Um, back in the old days, before barricades, when you could pay four and a half dollars to come in and abuse the band, I'd be up at the front of the stage wailing away and people would just grab the mic cord and pull it. <laughs> and either if it's taped up, you go to that person or sometimes the mic line is separated. And so I would wrap the mic cord around myself so I could literally keep the damn thing in my hand from front row antagonists. And that was our audience. And I started doing that, I don't know, <clears throat> two somewhere in there you'll see there's photos of me as a young skinny man with no mic wrap around and then somewhere in there you you see it and now, uh, now it's just necessity yeah and to this day where yeah. i'm in like a nice hall for people who are very polite um <laughs> i i wrap that mic cord around it is what it is yeah hey it works um so let's talk about that. Like early days when you, when you had, you know, people come in and for $4 to abuse the band, as you said, yeah. what was the importance of having your own mic? Maybe when you didn't, and, and maybe you thought like, God, I really should get my own mic. Let, let's talk about that. Okay. It's Especially kind of gross. The, it's kind of yeah. gross. <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll spare you. Um, many years ago, I was in England, the punk rock days where people would spit on the band. Where in in America, you know, someone you do that to a band, the guy waits for you after the show and like you know feeds you your. Car. But in England, that was a thing, and so we're dodging it. It's just it's not my thing. Anyway, I had my the mic to my side. I'm inhaling. Someone uh, broadcast some phlegm, <laughs> and, I, and I just perfect shot, and I just inhaled this oyster, a clam, I guess. And I'm like, no. And then I became wary of like, you know, you're in playing in some pretty rough clubs where the it's a 58, the ball is mangled and you can't see in it because there's so much accumulated saliva from the last guy and the last guy. And in those days, we didn't have the kind of money where you could play rock star. Like, I want my own mic. Somewhere in the 80s, I went, you know what? I want my own mic. Also, we're doing two sets a night in some places where there's like a seven and a 10. You try it. I mean, it's a lot. And I just needed more gear because the demands on me. And also I just said, you know what? I don't want to inhale anyone else's spit <clears throat> as it reconstitutes with my sweat because I can't get sick out here because we're doing 30 shows a month. And so for safety's sake, give me some money you know, and this is the black flag days. We didn't have money. So I'm like, hey, um, I'm lobbying for a mic. And, and, you know, someone shook loose some bucks. And I started having my own mic. And then it turned into two because one would have to drive because we don't really didn't really take nights off. And so that that's that's when it started. But it was it started in England inhaling someone else's snot. And uh, it happened to Joe Strummer once. And uh, he actually got sick from it. Luckily, I, you know, I survived. But that, that you was- You guys uh, hear that, huh? Wow. Turned me into, <laughs> turned me into a mic owning man. Yeah. So, okay. So let's talk about the importance of literally having your own mic. Henry, you mentioned this earlier. Let's tell the story about how the HR58 came about. Okay. Well, you and I are in contact fairly often. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've run a few angles, or, 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 you know buy you a few, you know, I try things out. All you can say is no or yes. And so I said, Corey, look, man, how about this? We call it the HR 58 because come on, I'm your boy. I'll take 7% of that action and you'll put HR 58 on the mic and, and we'll all be happy. It'll be a smash. And you know, you're, you're generous. You went, okay, yeah, you know, we'll take it under consideration. And I'm like, ha, 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 ha. And I go back to work, you go back to work. And several weeks later, I get this box with a Sure logo on it. I'm like, oh, okay, something came in. 
and I open up this box and there's two smaller boxes inside. And um, yeah, the label HR 58, we even had the label made and everything. Yeah. And that was years ago. Yeah. I still have the box. And here <laughs> is one of the two HR 58s. And I don't know how many times either road manager Ward or I have gone up to the local sound and said, you want to see something? You know what this is? And they're going, it's a 58. I'm like, I don't know. Look closer. And I point to the band where it says HR 58. And they are so impressed. <laughs> they're so yeah. they're like, wow, how'd you hook that up? I said, you know, a winning smile. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, you know, Corey hooked it up. And I said, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Um, Oh, so I, I take very good care of those because, you know, they're very yeah. I think you have two of two. Yes. Basically, yeah, yeah. But I think we need to get some more of those going, though, for uh, sure. I, I, I'll take another one right now, anytime. Yeah, well, yeah, once things get back to normal, I mean, we'll be out there. We're going to need some mics for you. So, y you know, you mentioned a little bit of this kind of, you know, it was actually interesting that that, that the, the thumb thing actually meant something to you. I just thought it was just, just pure you know, just angst and just grabbing the mic, but that, that, that it was a guide for you. That was actually interesting. I didn't, I didn't actually hear you say that before. Are there any other tips and tricks for using the iconic SM58 that you can share with everybody out there? I mean, I, I think you've make this thing sound like a punch in the face and, you know, a rock vocal and, you know, a DJ radio voice. You, you've, you've used it in many, many different ways. So what are some tips and tricks that you've learned over the years that maybe we didn't talk about yet? Sure. Well, um, you can get different sounds going with uh, how you place your hand on the ball of the mic. And you'll see so many rock singers, they basically just put it in their fist and sing through this tiny little hole. You're kind of robbing the 58 of what it can bring you. And so whenever possible, get off the ball of the mic and let the mic do its work. But there's some great compression that is achievable if you semi cup the ball of the mic and get up close on it. And where did I learn that? Nick Cave, when he was in the birthday party, because he would do this thing that sounded like, you know, eight woolly mammoths being knocked over. It was a fantastic sound. I was like, oh, I want to know how you do that. And so one night when I saw them play in 1983, when I was 40, um, I went right to the front to watch his mic technique. And he was using a 58. And when he would do these crazy howls, he would get on the ball of the mic and just get right, right in there like that. I was like, okay, that's how you do that. And so the mic is really dynamic and you can find all kinds of ways to hit it here, hit it here and find your voice in the mic and if you're going for different effects of intensity the closer you get up to it the the different is going to the more different is going to sound it will sound like you're literally closer to it and so find you know find things you want to do with that mic it's it's super nimble it can deliver a lot of different versions of you and so you should you know play around with it at band practice sound check i wouldn't demo ideas in front of a, a live audience in case it goes south but don't write off the 58 as a thing you just kind of bark or sing into because it can deliver a lot of different things. And um, when I do shows on my own, you know, a lot of them trying to be funny. And quite often I really need that. And now listen to this and I will get like that. I'll be way up on the ball of the mic and I'll be consciously using that much of it. When I yell, I don't want to yell on the mic because I'm going to compress the diaphragm too much. And so basically I hit it right about there. And so I yell, I yell past the mic so you can hear that I'm yelling, yet you won't be thrown out of your seat. And I've learned that you can, you don't necessarily have to be right down to the, the top of the ball of the 58 to actually have, have, grab you and put you through the PA. And so at sound check, um, road manager award, you know, I'll talk and I'll go, are you ready for a yell? And he'll go, yeah. And I'll go like, Hey, I'm yelling. And, and we'll, I'll go past the mic 
And I'm, I'm, I'm yelling past the mic so we don't get any sibilance because the sibilance is that's bad mic technique. P, T's, S's, D's, be careful because the listener hears that. They get whacked upside the head of it. And so um, there's, a lot you can, there's a lot more you can do with a 58 than you might know. And have fun, like, you know, band practice or whatever, fool around with it. If you're going for speaking, you, if you hold it too far away, it, it's not able to do what it can do. It's not picking up all the, the, the timber of your voice. And you might be selling your listeners short because you might have more mid and richness in your voice. When you hold it away, the frequency is gonna go up because you're giving it less information. And so find that sweet spot with your voice and this mic and listen to yourself talk and then try and match that through the front of house and learn your mic distance and your directionality with how you're approaching the ball of the mic. And you'll get all kinds of great stuff out of the 58. Awesome. Is there anything you would change about this microphone? I mean, you have quite a relationship with it already. Is there anything you would change? Um, if I was still doing music, I would maybe have a version of this with cross hatching on the stem. So it'd be really hard to lose it when you're sweating. Ah, okay. And yeah. A little bit change in the handle then. Yeah. yeah. And maybe, and you know, it's fine, but um, that would be kind of in an interesting approach. I might put something here to where it be hard to lose it because it would be a ring. Uh, and I would put an, an HR in front of the 58. That's <laughs> my main, yeah. But that'd be my main suggestion. I, I really recommend you guys get on that. Like, yeah. Well, I got to, now I got to talk to the new president. So, yeah. I mean, I, you know, before it was Rose when she was around and talking to Sandy, and now I got to talk to Chris. So I'll, uh, I'll go climb up the ladder and see what I could find out for you, man. <laughs> I want to post it and you know, put it on the door. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'll go to the next board meeting and see what they yeah. think. I mean, so awesome, you know, but there you go, guys. I mean, you know, everybody always asks me as an artist relations manager, what's the best microphone? What's the best microphone is j just like Henry talked about it. I mean, Henry's been doing this longer than, you know, a lot of us And you know, it's, it's talking shows. It's, 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 it's rock and roll. It's punk. What's the best microphone? Well, the best microphone is, is how you sound on a microphone. It's not, it's not the most expensive microphone. I mean, a, a 58 is a hundred dollar microphone and it's a tool it's it's used by so many bands and, and i think henry gave us a, a pretty good insight as to how he uses it and where he uses it in the years he's had, had with the mic so and here's thank the, you for your time go ahead sir there's just one last thing um if things don't work on the road you don't use them again like if the 58 wasn't really really good you wouldn't see it in the hands of so many people because the equipment guy would chuck them out because he doesn't want to catch flack from the band or front of house sound or the monitor guy. And so I'm not blowing any proverbial smoke. It, it's a great tool. And if it wasn't great, I, I wouldn't be here right now. And you'd see musician types, whoever, using a different mic yeah. because they're always looking for the best. And sound men, that's their job to be on this. And you see what the pros choose. And that, to me, that's your proof. Mm -hmm. Like, you just like, go online and just like look at anyone on tour 58, 58, 58, 58. There's a reason for that. Yeah. I mean, go to any rock club in, in, in America, even, even over in England. I mean, you're going to see yeah, a lot of 58s. It, it keeps working year after year, decade after decade. Yeah. With not a lot of bill change, I, I, I'm not aware of anything that you all have done really to change this. No, the recipe is the same. I mean, the ingredients have, have changed, obviously, because manufacturers haven't been around as long as Sure. I mean, Sure's 95 years old. That microphone is, what, 50? How, how old is the 58, everybody? Anyone want to chime in on that one? Is it 57 years old or where are we at? Anyway, I mean, we're going to get into this later on in the in the in the webinar. It's 54 years old. Um, it, it, it's it's the same recipe, you know. But I mean, not every manufacturer out there sending us materials for a grill or or wires or you know circuit boards or anything like they have. They're not around anymore. 
you know, and our standards are always military spec. And if they don't want to do mil spec, then they're not going to be our, 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 our supplier. That's the only thing that's really changed. We haven't changed the recipe at all. It's the same microphone. It's the most copyrighted microphone in the world. I mean, a counterfeit microphone in the world. I mean, you know, all the time you see that, but. Well, I've seen lookalikes. Absolutely. I've seen knockoffs. But they're, oh, they're, yeah. they're yeah. the same and the ball is never the same. Because they go the, low grade on the, on the grill, on the screen. It's the shock mount, too. It's the internal shock mount. That's where you can always tell. Then they cannot figure out that mathematical equation. Oh. So <laughs> it's a lot of math. And we're going to get into that stuff, actually. Uh, Henry, thank you so much for your time, bud. I really appreciate it. Um, I know you're busy. You know, back to your manuscript. Hopefully, yeah. we'll, we'll hear more about that later on this year. I hope we all get back on the road, including yourself. Yeah. Um, so I appreciate your time, man. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Hey, thanks. And uh, thanks for everyone who's listening. And, uh, you know, keep using sure mics. Thank you, sir. All right. See you guys. Uh, all right. Take care, man. Bye. I'm going to toss it back to Jason, who's going to have some more drawings for the wonderful SM58 microphone. And I'm going to take off. That was amazing. Thanks, Corey and and Henry. Uh, I learned a whole lot right there. So I uh, appreciate him jumping on. There's some pretty awesome stories in there. And I was watching some of the YouTube chat. You guys seem to be enjoying that quite a bit as well. So Henry, thank you again for, for coming to join us. Um, I'm going to get to our second round of drawings here in just a moment. I do want to uh, let everybody know that if you haven't registered to win a free SM58 today, you totally still can. Um, sure has put the link in the chat a few times. It is also just below the video in the description. So you can click that link, register to win. We're doing live drawing still. So we just did the drawing that I'm about to do. And there's two more left in this stream. So uh, if you haven't registered to win, please do so. Get your name in there uh, and get, get yourself a chance to win some 58s. Um, so without further ado, our second round, three more SM58s are going to go out to... The first one, Jonathan Sisson from Westerville, Ohio. Congrats, Jonathan. Our second one on this round is going to be Tom M. from Detroit, Michigan. And our third SM58 winner for round two, Jolie Pickett from San Diego, California. Uh, we will be reaching out to you guys via email to arrange um, shipment. Congratulations to our winners. We've got, what is it, seven, eight more or seven more microphones we're going to give away, three more regular SM58s, and four 50th anniversary editions at the very end here. Um, cool. So uh, our next segment that we're going to dive into, um, I'm pretty excited about. We have Michael Pedersen on deck, who is our sure corporate historian. Hey, Michael, how are you? Hi, Jason. Fine. So hey, I really, really appreciate coming on after Henry Rollins. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's really pretty nice cool. Of, really <laughs> nice of you guys. Yeah. I can say that he opened for me today. Yeah, nice. <laughs> there you go. Henry Rollins opened for Michael Pedersen. I great, love Tough act to follow. Great stories, man. It really, great, really was. Great yeah. stories. Um, hey, so let me uh, let me get this deck up for you. Uh, okay. Michael Pedersen's going to go over some, some history and some uh, pretty cool information of the 58. And uh, I'll let you take it away. Thank you. So I'm the sure historian, having been there since 1976. And I like to say I'm on my fifth and final career at sure. But when I was asked to do this, I was more than happy to come up with some, uh, some details. And so I think you'll find it interesting about where the 58 came from. And uh, lots of details on it. So 54 years, as Corey asked before. So we're gonna do some facts and some trivia, and then a personal story about Frank Sinatra, which I uh, I still shudder when I think about. So let's get on to the first slide here and take a look at the... So September 1966 is when we brought it out and introduces the SM58. SM stood for Studio Microphone. Uh, the idea originally was to sell us into radio and to, uh, TV studios, but of course, history proved otherwise. It employed what's called the Unidyne 3 microphone element that debuted in 1959. And it's the grandchild of the Unidyne 1 and the child of the Unidyne 2. So we're gonna take just a few minutes and explore its ancestry. 1939, here is the Unidyne 1, the Model 55, sometimes known as the Fat Boy. Sure, never calls it that, but that's how it's gotten known. And this was the world's first unidirectional, moving coil, dynamic microphone with a single capsule. So that was a real breakthrough for it. Next slide, please. Here's the guy who invented it. His name is Benjamin B. Bauer. He was born in Russia in 1913 and eventually emigrated all the way over to the United States. 
And here he is in 1945. Uh, he eventually came in as a co-op student uh, and actually ended up being the vice president of engineering. Had over 100 patents to his name, by the way, when he passed away in 1979. The IEEE actually recognized the Unidyne microphone as a key invention of the 20th century. And in 2014, we got a milestone award for the Unidyne One. This is November 1937. Um, we have Ben Bauer's originally lab notebooks. They actually had been lost for 60 years and they were discovered off site uh, recently. And uh, I got to go through them and read them and document them. And when I got to this page, literally the hair on the back of my neck stood up because it says single crystal cardioid element. But if you look halfway down the stage, you'll see page, you'll see P1, P2, R1, R2. That's the electrical equivalent of the acoustical network that makes the Unidyne 1 and the Unidyne 2 and the Unidyne 3 operate. And I love Bauer's note up there. He says, the following arrangement seems to offer possibilities. Yes, it did, Ben. It basically changed the world. So there is an understatement of the ages. But you're actually looking at the first day where he drew out what was called the Uniphase Acoustical Network. Again, I just love stuff like this. So what did the first Unidyne prototype look like? There it is. Really lovely, isn't it? This is around 1937. And that was the first microphone that Bauer put together by hand, as you can tell. It operated in a directional manner with one microphone dynamic element. But there was no magnet on it. He actually took a horseshoe magnet and stuck it to the bottom of the base to magnetize it up and get it work. So we actually have all the prototypes, but the number one is just so crude and ugly. I love to show it. Next one, please. So we went from industrial design prototype, and by the way, this is what, this is a carved wooden prototype of what the Unidyne one was gonna look like. This is from 1938. It is made out of wood, painted in uh, silver paint, and we didn't even know it existed. When we moved from Evanston to Niles in around 2003, someone crawled underneath the anechoic chamber in Evanston and pulled out a box, and in that box there was a note, Unidyne prototype 1938, and that's what it looked like. So we went from prototype to, to the actual finished product, which is the next slide, in basically two years. Next slide, please. So what was the inspiration for the appearance of the Unidyne? This bothered me. Where did this cool microphone come from? So I knew that Mr. Schur drove Oldsmobile's cars. And I was looking through Oldsmobile catalog, and I found this. There you go. 1937 Oldsmobile Coupe 6. Uh, I say inspiration or coincidence. I'm not certain, but it's got the same number of horizontal ribs, the same rib down the middle. It looks an awful lot like the Unidyne. If you're a Christmas movie fan and you actually see the Christmas story every year where Ralphie wants the BB gun, check out the car his father drives. It's exactly this model with exactly that grill. By the way, a guy named Wes Scherer was the actual industrial designer of the Unidyne one. Ben Bauer invented the inside, Wes Scherer invented or created the outside. 1939, we introduced it. They actually introduced two important microphones in 1939. One was the Unidyne, which was priced at $45. That's about $835 today. And our first ribbon microphone as well, the Rocket Model 50. But this gives you an idea of that. I mean, SM58 now it's around $100. Imagine a Unidyne one now, if we actually kept up with inflation, it would be $835. Next, please. Uh, 41, we got the patent. And by the way, this patent actually applied later to the Unidyne 3. There it is. Ben Bombsweiger was his actually given name. And here it is. And there is at the bottom of that, that same circuit that was originally in his notebook. But again, 41, he changed the name from Bombsweiger to Bauer just to shorten it up and sound more American, if you will. 1951, television comes about. Unidyne 1 is seen as way too big for television, covers too much of the face. And so we bring out the 55S. S simply means small. It's about 66% of size of the original Unidyne 1. This is the microphone size that we still make today. So we've been making this size Unidyne 1951 all the way through 2020. Here's a print ad we had from 52, the microphone that needs no name. It was so popular by then that actually we ran an ad and didn't even put the sure name in it. So at this time, the Unidyne 1 and the Unidyne 2 were very popular microphones for live sound in the 40s and the 50s, sometimes for radio, sometimes for TV, but primarily, almost like today, primarily for live sound. 
Elvis used the Unidyne one so much, it actually became known as the Elvis microphone. Again, sure, never call it that, but it's kind of picked up that nickname. And of course, there was a stamp in the mid 90s too, which had the young Elvis and the Unidyne one on it. So here's Elvis and the Unidyne one. And then next we have Mr. Sinatra and the Unidyne two. So old Blue Eyes first sang into that in the 40s when he was with the Dami, Tommy Dorsey Orchestra. And towards the end of this presentation, I'm going to tell you about my uh, encounter with Mr. Sinatra, which was a scary encounter, I'll just say that. We also have people that love it so much, they tattoo their bodies with it. Go to Google sometime when you're bored, put in micro, go to the image page in Google and put in microphone tattoo and you will find page after page after page of Unidyne tattoos. One guy came up to me at a trade show and he actually had the image on his right arm. Go back for one just a second. Image on his right arm, he had the polar pattern on his left arm and then he unbuttoned his shirt and showed me the frequency response on his chest. Now I've worked at this company for 43 years and I really like it a lot, but I would never ever do that. Next please. So 1959, finally, the Unidyne 3. Again, the well, Unidyne 1 was a big one, 39. Unidyne 2, smaller one, 1951. In 1959, we bring out the Unidyne 3, which is the 545. It was advertised as the world's smallest cardioid dynamic microphone, had a user price of $50, and note, no XLR connector had the Amphenol connector. And the Amphenol was actually in use from the late 30s to the early 70s. Next, please. Who invented the Unidyne 3? It was Ernie Seeler. And there's a, one of the very few photographs of Ernie Seeler. He did not like to be photographed. Uh, he was basically born in Cuba of German parents. Uh, 1920, he was born, worked at Schur starting in 1953 and retired in 1997. Uh, Ernie's first microphone, and his primary, most important was the Unidyne 3. And it was interesting because you sang into the end of the microphone rather than the side of the microphone. And with the Unidyne 1 and the Unidyne 2, you sang into the side. So this is called, a, Unidyne 3 is called an N-Fire. A key benefit of N-Fire microphones is that the polar pattern is uniform about its axis. What that means is you can stick a pencil right down the core of a Unidyne 3, rotate it, and the polar pattern is exactly the same no matter how that microphone is turned. By doing that, you can actually turn it up louder in sound systems, better for game before feedback. And this led to stadium and concert outdoor events like Woodstock. And actually at Woodstock, all the microphones were Unidyne 3 model 565s. The ironic thing is Ernie hated rock music. There's a presence peak, as most of you know, in the Unidyne 3, starts around 2000 Hertz, peaks out around five or 6,000 Hertz and drops off. This really bothered Ernie. Ernie wanted this to be a flat response microphone and he could never get rid of that. But you know something, that is the signature sound of the Unidyne 3, SM58 and 57. And who knows, if we hadn't had that, would it have maintained the popularity over five decades? I kind of doubt it. So the present speak, Ernie didn't like it. It was there and it actually became a characteristic that people love about this microphone. A guy named Bob Carr worked at Sure. And in 1963 and 64, he came up with the idea of a new line of microphones for studios, radio, television, and film studios. The line was going to be based on existing mics, like the Unidyne 3 545, but it would have a non-reflective finish. It would have an XLR connector instead of an Amphenol. It would be balanced low impedance only, and there would be, non -on, there would be no on-off switch, or if there was a switch, it would be hidden by the plate, by a plate. So in 64, the first line came out. There was the SM5 showing on the right there, which is a big voiceover or boom microphone. There was an SM33, a variation of a ribbon mic, a 50, which is a variation on Omni, the SM56, which is a variation of the 546, and the SM76, which is an Omni. So that was the original SM line. Next, please. 1964, the first, the SM Unidyne 3 SM56 arrives. And there it is. We don't make it anymore. This is a very popular microphone for years. $81, had a non-reflective gray finish, had an XLR connector and a front plate. Hidden behind that front plate was a three position switch. It would give you high impedance, off or low impedance. If you didn't want the switch, you just covered it up with a plate. Very, very popular in Las Vegas because they actually would apply Loctite to the threads, screw it out of the mic stands to deter theft in the actual showrooms. 65, so the SM microphones didn't catch on right away. And here's the Beatles and the Unidyne 3, a model 545 when they're performing in Chicago. 
I love this. If you look really closely at the windscreen, it's held on by a rubber band. Very, very high tech. So they had, uh, there was an A25B adapter. There was a quick disconnect adapter, which allowed you to take the microphone off the stand. Sure had loaned 12 of these microphones on all the accessories to Beatles management for the tour. And the idea was after the tour was over, that the microphones were going to be returned to Sure, and then they were going to be auctioned off for charity. So the tour ends, a month goes by, two months go by, no Beatles microphones. So our PR department contacts the Beatle management and said, where's the microphones? And they said, oh, we sent them back. Uh, I sent them back about uh, 45 days ago. They had sent them back in a cardboard box with no markings on it. The service department didn't know what to do with them. And so they scrapped them all. There goes the auction. 1965, the SM57 was introduced. That was basically carried a price of $63. Though, of course, known as a snare drum microphone, known as an amplifier microphone as well, it's also been used by the White House Communications Agency since 1966 when they first deployed it for Lyndon Johnson. Uh, currently, through been used by every U.S. president since then, and they have over 400 units at there. Uh, part of my job for 25 years, I actually was the consultant or the liaison to the White House. It was an interesting job, uh, but they can be a difficult client, let's <laughs> just say that. Next, please. Finally, here we go. SM6, XM58 hits the stores 1966, September 1966, as a matter of fact. Uh, user price was $81. Think about that now. Now they're $99, 54 years later, just a few dollars more. But, but look this out. First year sales, 145 units, only 145. And we actually did not exceed 1,000 a year until 1971. As a matter of fact, in 1970, the SM56 and the 57 and the 58 were being considered for discontinuation because they weren't making their forecast numbers. And there was a sales manager at the time, a guy named Roger Ponto, who actually hired me. And he said to the vice president of sales at the time, well, before we give up on this thing, let me take some of these microphones out to Las Vegas and see how, if they work well on live stages for PA systems. Thank God Roger did that because we hadn't done that. Who knows? SM50, the whole SM57 line and the SM58 line may have never made it to this to 2020. Next, please. So what was one of the first major pop festivals using SM microphones? Well, based on my research, it's the Monterey Pop Festival in, uh, in 1967. And here's Jimi Hendrix with an SM56 and an A2WS windscreen on it. This was the first major fest that I've been able to find photographic evidence, having sure SM microphones on it. McCune Sound of San Francisco supplied the PA system and a guy named Abe, Abe Jacobs, whoever actually went on to do New York theater audio later, specified the gear. So the 56 and the A2SWS windscreen was used as a frontline vocal mic, as well as a backline and performers at that event were Janis Joplin, Hendrix, The Who, Jefferson Airplane, The Birds, The Mamas and Papas, and many more. But this was the first major event. So here's an SM56 that was used on stage at Monterey Pop 1967 and other festivals. And you can see that actually this is, was owned by McCune Sound, but the microphone now is in the Shure Archive. So if you ever come and visit the Shure Archive, you can see this microphone. In 66, McCune purchased 50 SM56 microphones, engraved them, number one through number 50, and stuck a red label on it that said, Harry McCune Sound, San Francisco. This is number 45. Now, we don't know if this is actually the same microphone. The label in front of Hendrix there, you can see the red label. It was one of the McCune microphones. Of course, McCune never took notes about, oh, yeah, we put number 43 on Hendrix at this date. They just didn't do that. But we do know this. This is one of the microphones that was used for all the festivals in the late 60s. So towards this, I'm going to uh, take a little hint from John Cleese and do a little silly walk. I'm going to answer some SM58 questions that I get all the time as an, the historian. So where the model number came from? Yeah, very simple. It's not a mystery. 1939, model 55, 5155 S, 1964, SM56, SM57, SM58. Was there an SM59? Yes, we'll talk about that later. Uh, but SM58 now is so well known worldwide as a model, it's actually a registered trademark of Sure Incorporated. So there you go, simply a sequence of numbers. Are the 58 and the 57 the same? Yes. The mic element is a Unidyne 3. 
The fundamental difference between the two is a protective grill and the grill fastening method. So on the 58, of course, you have a metal ball grill and that threads onto what's called a closing ring. And on the 57, you have a rotating plastic grill that's secured by a little spring metal C-shaped clip. But the geometry of that grill alters the high frequency response. And you can see these differences if you look at the user guides. So the Unidyne 3 is also used in the model 545 and 565, which are current models. And it's a variation in our SM7B, which is now a high, hugely popular podcasting mic. Uh, and the SM7 was first introduced in 1973. 58 was never patented. The Unidyne 3 mic element was patented. So that utility patent covered all the models that use the Unidyne 3 element. The only design patent we had, and by the way, a utility patent is about how something operates. The design patent is how something looks. The only design patent we had on was for the 545, which is also the SM57. So the next slide will show us that design patent. Here it is, July 1st, 1961. This is called microphone. Um, if you want to if you, you know, take a photo of this design 190864, you can look it up on Google and get all the other details of it. But this is the design patent for the 545, which of course also was used for the SM57. It was designed by a gentleman named Bob Deshaw in West Chicago. He didn't work for sure. He was an independent industrial designer. But talk about designing a microphone that's last now for, you know, 55 years for the SM7, SM57, excuse me. 58 really has only one moving part. We're just going to set the pneumatic shock mount aside. And that is the actual mylar plastic diaphragm and a fine wire, you know, coil of fine copper wire. There's actually 40 feet of wire in the voice coil. The weight of it's about two tenths of a gram. And what US penny weighs three grams. So one penny is basically the same as 15 SM58 diaphragm and voice coil assemblies. Can a singer damage the SM58 with excessive sound pressure? Well, we know Henry damages it with excessive sweating, but basically you cannot make a sound so loud that it's gonna damage an SM58 diaphragm and voice coil. Typically what happens when they hear that is that they're actually over clipping the input on the mixer. Uh, if you talk into an SM58 at normal sound pressure levels, you know, from let's say a couple inches away, conversation level, the output's about two millivolts. If you sing at the top of your lungs for 130 dB, now your output's gonna be around 160 millivolts. So if you set your mixer for two millivolts and you put 160 into it, you're gonna clip it, which could sound like you're distorting the microphone, but actually what you do is you're distorting the input of the um, mixer. The actual length of excursion, the maximum that diaphragm can move is about one one thousandth of an inch. So if you really had a really hugely loud sound, let's say like a, a rocket taking off uh, at uh, a NASA rocket, um, what would happen is the diaphragm would be stopped by the metal pole piece and no, move no farther. And we wouldn't damage it, it just wouldn't move any farther. Some other little wrapping up with a little bit of trivia. Uh, the original 58 handle was two-toned. It was a dark gray background with some darker gray flex. As I mentioned before, SM stood for studio microphone because we were trying to sell it to radio and television and film studios. If you find an original 58 from 66, 67, 68, there's a little step down near the XLR connector where the diaphragm, uh, di diameter increased in size. Never figured out what it was for, just a stylized thing, I think. Uh, the original 58 had dual impedance, low impedance, 50 ohms and 150 ohms. Uh, the air trapped inside there um, is actually takes as part of the vibration isolation mechanism. The 58 grill, of course, is a uh, Handle it's actually designed as a crumple zone. Henry mentioned that you crumple it and you can push it out with a wooden file handle. The 58 has been used upon the International Space Station. They use it for talk back for when kids are uh, talking to the astronauts. And we had a PE 50 SP in the 1970s, which was an SM58 with an on off switch. So, just some trivia about the 58. So, let's tell us the Sinatra story. 1977, and there it in the bottom left of the corner is a Shure SM59. And I was fairly young then. And my boss told me, he says, Sinatra's operator is rehearsing today at Caesar's Palace. Take this 59 over there, get his sound man to try it out and see what his, see what his uh, reaction is. So I go over to Caesar's Palace. I talked to Dave Rogers. He was a Caesar's Palace sound man. And he basically says, oh yeah, I'll take it down the stage and we'll see if we can swap it out for Frank's mic. So I stay in the sound booth. 
Dave goes down to the stage. I'm probably 100 feet away. I see him talking to Sinatra Sandman, and there's this really heated exchange going on. You can tell, tell from the difference from the body language. Eventually, Sinatra Man, Sandman shrugs his shoulders, takes Sinatra's 58 off the stand, puts on the SM-59, and goes off stage. Sinatra comes out, greets the band, jokes around with them, and he sees the microphone, but he doesn't see his normal microphone. And he says, I will clean this up. Where's my friggin' SM-58? Sound man over the side of the stage says, Frank, it's a new microphone from Sure. We'd like you to try it out. So he kind of says, all right. So he counts off the band, sings no more than eight bars, and he takes the 59 off the stand and throws it with all his might to the stage left. And it slides along the floor, and it hits the wall, and he screams at his sound man, get my SM58. So the sound man runs over, unplugs the 59, plugs in the 58, puts it on the stand. Sinatra's satisfied. He goes back to rehearsal. Sinatra's sound man brings it up to the sound booth, hands it to me, and he says, he didn't like it. I basically took it and turned tail and run. So uh, that's why I said about tell that kid from sure not to come back. That was my one and only encounter with Mr. Old Blue Eyes. 2008, you know that Roger Daltrey has been a big Sure fan for years. Here's a letter from Rose Sure, who was our owner and CEO at the time, about uh, to Mr. Daltrey because they were going on their 27th concert tour. And I just like this line. In your role as the front man for the Who, you have provided enormous visibility for our model SM58 and inspired countless musicians to follow in your path. So it's just a lovely letter from Mrs. Sure to Roger Daltrey. And thanks, because Roger's been using the 58, I think, since probably 1966, if I'm not mistaken. Next, please. 2017, Sure did, we partnered with the Who and Sir Paul McCartney to auction off these limited edition microphones. Uh, the, all the proceeds went to charities that uh, McCartney's Meat Free Monday and the Who's Teen Cancer America. Uh, the designs were provided by McCartney's folks and also by the Who's people. And it just was a cool thing to do. We had 300 SM58 microphones for the auction, serial numbers 11 to 300. And they were also serial numbers one through 10, which actually were high and signed autographs on the microphone handles. They're out there. I've got one of the McCartney ones. Uh, they're pretty cool. So let's wrap this up. 54 years after its debut, you know, still continues to be a favorite with engineers and performers and broadcasters and recording studios. Here's a Roger Daltrey mic that we've got kept in our archive. You can see how it's all wrapped up. And just my question to all the viewers are, do you remember your first SM58? I certainly do, and I still have it. Ryan, whoever's going to take it over, take it from here. Ah, Andy. there we go. Here's my wrapped up 58. There you go, I man. In my archives. Yeah. Roger Daltrey yeah. signed even, right? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Very, very well, thank cool. you so much. Thank you so much, Michael. We really welcome, enjoyed Ryan. all that information. Glad to do it, man. And uh, appreciate your time today. Thank you. I'll step uh, around for questions later. Appreciate that. Yeah. As, as, as I was going to mention uh, before we kick it over to John Bourne. If you have any questions, we'll be answering some of those during the Q&A portion close to the end of the event. So just type those in on the YouTube feed, and we'll do our best to get to all of those at the end. So now I'm going to throw it over to Mr. John Bourne, our Senior Manager in Product Management, who's going to talk more about the technical aspects of the 58. Hello, everyone. Hope everyone is well. I'm uh, John Bourne. I'm the Product Manager here at Sure, one of the many guys who and girls who are working on microphones and I get to maintain the uh, product category for SM and uh, with that, the SM58. So uh, we're gonna go through a couple slides here real quick on just um, the quality of work we do uh, in the quality department and how the SM58 has changed over the years with one premise that uh, thou shalt not touch the actual performance specification of the SM58. And uh, we'll dive right into kind of what the testing we do right now, so fire away off, Jason. So we have a whole annex, technology annex in, in, at our headquarters devoted to breaking microphones. Um, so we have over 80 quality tests that we go through uh, to, to at both the component level of the mic and also the finished goods level of the microphone before we can release a product into the wild. Uh, so this is just a shot of our annex where we have all of our, our environmental chambers moisture resistance, hot and cold storage, 
packaging, drop test, uh, operational temperature, sweat. Um, this is just one of the many places at Sure that we can destroy things. Um, that's me doing one of our stand drop tests. So every, every microphone and product goes through various drop tests at various angles. Um, this is the, the manual version. We also have an automated version with this huge machine that comes down and releases the microphone six inches before it hits the ground to make sure that we can see exactly where the microphone drops. Uh, we also have like high speed cameras capturing all that information so that we can see uh, what breaks as it's dropping. Uh, so a lot of just really cool technology that goes into all of the development and quality process of, of Sure. This is a cool chamber called the HALT chamber, the highly accelerated life test. Uh, this test is meant to basically break the thing that you are trying to make. Uh, it accelerates the life. It takes 10 years of use and consolidates it into about 15 minutes. So uh, you can change, uh, this thing will sh vigorously shake the product at like 10 Gs and then the temperature will change from maybe 200 Fahrenheit to negative 100 Fahrenheit in about 10 seconds. And it basically contracts everything uh, and we can figure out how it breaks. And if it's something that we can improve, we go ahead and do it. Next slide. We got x-ray machines. We just invested in a uh, MRI and a CAT scan machine so we can actually see inside of product without having to open it up. Um, we use that a lot for like batteries and such and such so that we can see battery cells and see if they're uh, welded together properly. Uh, so we have a ton of more equipment, highly accurate measuring equipment, laser scanners and stuff like that. So we can check individual parts before they go into an assembly to make sure that uh, they're going to result in a good product. And we got, we, we joke at Sure that we, we sometimes break more microphones than some companies actually sell. And uh, I think that's very true. Uh, we do a pretty extensive product audit on, and selected lots throughout our, um, our, both our finished goods products, products that are shipping already, along with products that are in development. But we, we have no hesitation to go into our warehousing, take a pallet of, of product out, put it through all the tests and destroy them. Uh, just to make sure that we are getting good product to our customers. And that is something that, um, that we take very seriously. And virtually every product we make goes through some sort of uh, product audit on an ongoing basis, uh, along with all the, the, the line testing that we do on, in, in production. And lastly, we, uh, we have uh, obviously a lot of wireless products as well. And we are a certified lab uh, in terms of the FCC's perspective as well. So we can self-certify uh, most of our products uh, we have a pretty extensive RF chamber to um, allow us to do that. And uh, it is costly, but it's worth it because uh, we can make sure that we're delivering not only the best microphones, but also you know, the best wireless experience you want to have, whether it's a wireless SM58 or a wire 58. Uh, we want to make sure that you're, we, we can do all that testing. So now we're going to dive into a couple um, cool things about the SM58 uh, in terms of its manufacturing. So uh, the premise is, Obviously, keeping our product alive for 54 years doesn't go without a lot of work. And, uh, and obviously, the volume, we do sell a lot of SM58s. Um, so uh, we, we want to make sure that we um, can maintain the level of quality on every single product that goes out the door. And the SM58, we take very seriously, obviously. So we've improved like the ball grill improvements over time. We, the plating, uh, the chrome plating that is on those products, um, even the foam that's been inside of that product, we, we've, in, we've improved. Um, so the ball grill itself is taken very seriously. The brazing at the bottom of the cage of the ball grill to the ring, uh, we've improved that brazing step so that um, if it does dent and when, it, when you drop it, none of the little wires like poke out at you. Uh, the, those are all like the, the, the level of detail we go through in terms of just a simple ball grill. Uh, we have hours and hours and days of, of, of mechanical design work in, in a part like that. Um, obviously, we replace the, the, the logo with a pad print that doesn't come off uh, where it traditionally was a sticker. Uh, the paint formulation constantly goes through improvements, adhesion processing, priming, um, baking, all those types of uh, process related to a paint adhesion is uh, under scrutiny all the time um, because that, that is something that obviously is going to get handled <laughs> in a very unique way through all of our artists. So uh, that's some of, the, some of the exterior improvements going into the inside of the mic here. We'll go to the next slide. So 
so many sly clicks. Um, so here we are in, inside the mic. So uh, coil assembly, we talked about the diaphragm and the coil. So in the mic, there's a, there's a molded plastic diaphragm. It's attached to a voice coil. Uh, so the, when we attach that coil to the diaphragm, uh, the adhesion process that, that we go through, that, that, that we use a vision system where the, the laser, uh, a laser can see where the part is, a pin comes down and it traces it along the diaphragm uh, and the glue that we use and all those types of improvements in that process is extremely important because that is truly the engine of the SM58, the diaphragm and the coil when it comes together. Uh, the pole piece is the part that directs that magnetic circuit around and pushes that magnetic field to the, to the gap where the coil lives. Uh, and we've done a lot of and structural changes to that part to make sure that it doesn't shift when it gets dropped. Um, we've also done a lot of uh, diaphragm material processing uh, where the diaphragm itself, we, we, we press at sure as well. And uh, making sure that that is the most consistent thing is, is arguably that the best thing we can do is by dialing in the consistency of the diaphragm, the shape of that diaphragm uh, yields in the most consistent product because that, that is truly the response of the mic. Uh, so all those things over time we've improved. Um, you can imagine in manufacturing we have rows and rows of diaphragm presses and uh, making sure every single one of them is consistent is extremely important. Click on the next slide inside the mic. Uh, cutting that diaphragm out of the out of the mylar is important obviously. So we, uh, we used to punch it and now we use a laser that is a lot cleaner uh, and faster. Uh, and the resistance part is arguably the most important part in any microphone is the resistance part, the acoustic resistance part. So uh, when you create a polar pattern, you have to delay that air and that sound uh, from entering the back of the mic. And that resistance part, the tolerance on that is arguably the most important part of a, of a directional microphone. Uh, and how you achieve that is through, um, through gaps and, and tiny holes. Uh, sometimes it's cloth, sometimes it's it's uh, tiny holes that are electroformed, um, but the way we do it in SM58 is pretty unique. Uh, it, each one is individually tuned to the microphone. Um, we, we actually pull a vacuum on every microphone, and as we dial in that resistance, uh, it is tuned to the exact assembly of that individual SM58. And that is arguably one of the, the most unique things in the SM58 is that tuning process is, is very um, important and very proprietary to how we can achieve really great consistency across the SM58 over such a long period of time. Also inside the mic, um, using better things like water-based adhesives and um, using um, the hot melt inside the handle. If you ever taken up the 58, you see that stuff inside. So that's extremely important because one, it, it pots the transformer that's in the SM58 uh, to seal it, to make sure that it can't corrode. But the other important thing is the volume inside that space right there from the, from the glue that you see up into the microphone uh, is extremely critical to maintaining uh, the tune-up of that mic. So that's something that kind of goes underlooked um, in, in a lot of uh, other mics is because we actually use the volume inside the air of the handle of the SM58 in the microphone's polar pattern and in the microphone's tune-up. But that's part of the pneumatic shock mount, which is so special with the SM58. That's why the handling noise is so low. So as that microphone element moves, uh, because it's receiving handling noise, uh, the volume of that air inside the handle actually feeds back up into the microphone. And that tune-up uh, results in pages of math to make that happen. Um, literally pages of math, uh, but the, the where how much volume is in that handle is, is also a critical portion to, to making sure that uh, that whole tune-up assembly is, is accurate. So uh, really, really cool stuff. The, the premise on the SM58 is that all these changes we've done across the years, um, we have literally at SM58s virtually every year, decade by decade, and we shall not change the performance experience that you receive on an SM58, but the way we get there might change. But uh, the thing that you expect to get on an SM58 shall not change. And that's something that we take really seriously at sure. So thanks for the time for letting me uh, spiel on that. Excellent. Thank you so much, John. We really appreciate that. And uh, now we're going to throw it back over to Mr. Jason, who's going to give away a few more 58s. I'm back. I'm either your best friend or you, you really don't like me because I'm not giving you a free mic. I'm not sure which one it is, but I'm back to give away a few more free SM58s uh, to you guys that registered. Thank you for jumping in here. John, 
Michael Patterson, fantastic information. Even uh, every time we do this, I learn something about this product um, and I, I just love it. So thank you guys for being here. Um, so we're on to four more standard SM58s to our lucky winners. Uh, so the first winner of our third round of drawing is Ken Thompson from Hutto, Texas, H-U-T-T-O. Uh, second winner is going to be David Webster from Hoffman Estates, Illinois. Uh, Illinois, sorry, all my Chicago people. Uh, third winner is going to be Vicky Page from Chicago, Illinois. Boy, we got a bunch of people from Chicago. It's our headquarters. That's definitely uh, uh, pretty awesome. And our last winner is Doris Ramirez from Chicago, Illinois as well. Congratulations to the four winners. Thank you guys again for being here. Um, Ryan, I think I'm going to pitch it back to you because you've got our next round of guests in the can ready to uh, jump into a roundtable discussion here. Uh, I hope, you know, I'm looking forward to this section as well. That'll be fun, uh, definitely. Uh, but before we do that, I think we've got a video we wanted to share with everyone here real quick. That we do. So I will... Uh... SM58 has defined the standard for professional vocal microphones on stage and in the studio since 1966. The tailored frequency response of the SM58 is specifically tailored for vocal applications. A slight increase in low frequencies delivers a warm sound. Bass roll-off and a brightened mid-range helps your voice cut through the mix. The uniform cardioid pickup pattern isolates the main sound source, minimizes background noise and reduces the possibility of feedback. The SM58 features a pneumatic shock mount that cuts down handling noise, and the built-in spherical filter minimizes wind, breathing, and pop noise. Its legendary ruggedness and durability have made the SM58 the first choice for musicians and sound engineers worldwide. doing monitors and uh we're just going to have a conversation with you guys so Stuart, uh let's start with you tell me about some of the first times you used the sm58 uh the first time the first time i was uh i used to play in bands which most of us did some of us still do but um i was playing as a guitar player i was going to play with these uh with these guys locally and uh, I brought an AKG microphone to mic up my uh, guitar amp and kind of the leader or singer of the van uh, looked at me and said hey son if you're if you're not coming up here with sure microphones you're not gonna be in my band <laughs> oh, so so yeah he had a 57 he put on my amp for me and uh, you know that was the first time using it but uh, I really cut my teeth using it um, the 58 anyway um, Worked at a rehearsal studio here in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, called Nashville Cartage and Sound. Years ago, we had three rooms, so you'd run through about uh, three rooms, and you turn the rooms out three to four times a day. So nine to twelve bands a day using multiple. We probably had eighty or ninety fifty eights in house there, so uh, got to use those on a lot of different uh, speaker systems. And each room had a different system different size room and got to learn the characteristics of the mic quite a bit there. That's great. Uh, before I get to you, John, we're going to do a, a reintroduction here. I guess our mics came on a little bit late. So, um, so yeah, I'm speaking with Stuart Delk and John Lozer of Rascal Flats, uh, 
Stuart does monitors and John does front of house. And so uh, we caught a little bit of Stuart talking about his first experience with the 58. John, what about you? When was the first time you laid hands on the 58? Um, similar for me, I was in a band. Uh, I played bass and sang a little backup. But uh, basically it was all clubs. And I, I think most of the places that I, we would play probably had one real 58 and a bunch of knockoffs and you know the lead singer would get the real one and we'd deal with whatever we had otherwise um the first the first club i had ever did sound at uh was the same way and we'd always you know make sure the ma main guy w had the real one because <laughs> it, it was a noticeable difference that's cool yeah. so uh stewart talk about some of the artists that you've used the 58 on up through your career uh, man, I think, I know Daryl Dodd, Sons of the Desert, a lot of country acts, most of us out of Nashville to tour with in the country market. Um, yeah, but Daryl, Sons of the Desert, a girl named Lila McCann, um, worked with the artist uh, named Ty Herndon, and then I've been with Rascal Flats for 18 years, so this has awesome. been our go-to mic for uh, quite some time. Excellent. And John, how long have you been with Rascal Flats? Uh, I've been with them, uh, what? eight years now and uh, uh gary's been on sm58 the whole time uh we've tried a couple other things but uh stuck with the 58 uh used a 58 with prince for a while uh, we tried a couple other things and it never worked as well i'll say gotcha yeah Stuart. uh maybe you can take us into the story of how the 58 made it onto rascal flat stage <laughs> um I started with Rascal Flats in 2002, March of 2002, um, and um, the management had already, and the engineer, there was a front of house engineer and, uh, on staff already, so but uh, they had to deal with Sennheiser microphones, and um, uh, we were using the, a lot of different mics. We went from a 935 to uh, ended up, once the tour got rolling and budget uh, came into play, we, um, and they worked, uh, Sennheiser was working with us on different ones for Gary, uh, but we ended up on a Neumann KK-104 capsule on like a 5,000 series um, handheld, and we were at the CMT, it used to be called the Flameworthy Awards, um, but the CMT Awards here in Nashville at Belmont University, and um, uh, they had just produced, had a new producer come on to produce their albums for Rascal Flats, Dan Huff. And uh, Dan had produced, started producing Carrie Underwood and Rascal at the same time. And uh, Carrie was singing on a 58 at the time, and Gary was on the 104. And Carrie was holding the mic up to her mouth, you know, using really good mic technique. And um, Gary, with the 104 being condenser, was holding it way down here and just singing. And of course, management had told Gary, you know, keep it low out of your face so the camera can see your face. But uh, in the recording truck, um, apparently word came through, you know, I found out uh, afterwards after the rehearsal, but word came through that uh, Dan was in there producing and making sure everything sounded good for the mix out to broadcast. But uh, Dan said, hey, we need to, I don't know what Mike Carey's singing on, but we need to get Gary on the same microphone because it sounds way better. And um, that's kind of where uh, we left Sennheiser and um, came over to shore. And it just so happened that Ryan was in the hallways backstage at the, at the um, award show. And I just, I just remember walking up to him going, man, this is your lucky day. <laughs> Cause and I uh, said, Hey, Stuart. we're going <laughs> to, yeah. Hey, uh, can you get me a 58 for this, uh, for this uh, song that they're about to do on national TV? <laughs> of course, I've always been a, a, a sure fan, but uh, you know, just like I said, when I came on with the band, they were already working with Sennheiser and they didn't, I didn't, you know, being the new guy, I didn't want to ruffle feathers and try to switch microphones on the main guy, the singer. So, um, but yeah, that was kind of so, our lucky day is when Dan Huff said, Hey, you need to, you need to switch to that other microphone. Yeah. And so why do you guys keep using it? Go ahead, John. I'm sorry. I, I missed that, Ryan. I said, why do you guys keep using the 58? Why does it work so well for you? Uh, well, a lot of kind of what Stu said, it keeps it keeps the mic technique really close. You know, um, for me, you know, Gary's out in front of the PA a lot. Um, we always have a big thrust. So it, it helps having a mic that he can hear himself stay and, and that he wants to stay close to, you know. 
um, any any other mic that we've tried, it just doesn't it doesn't kind of project the same way. Um, I don't, we don't have as as good gain before feedback. Um, all of those things. I mean, sound quality wise, it, it just it it makes it where he can sound like himself to himself, and then he projects really well to me. <laughs> So uh, that and and it's durable. So it, you know we have backups and rarely ever need anything. So um, it's just one of those things. That it always sounds the same, and it always sounds like Gary. That's great. Well, uh, talk about a little bit about what you put in your uh, signal chain out at front of house, if you could. Well, uh, wait. What do I have over here? Um, I I've got it's the. Uh, um, one of the Rupert Neve uh, primary source enhancers. I use one of those lately, um, a distressor and a BSS 901. And I use that for all three of the guys. And I, um, that's pretty much it. I uh, used to use some plugins and kind of went back to the analog stuff. Uh, but that really kind of does the, does the trick and um, makes everything sit in the pocket really well. That's awesome. Stu, can you talk a little bit about about that from the monitor side? Um, I used to use some uh, like a C6 and a lot of some outboard stuff plugins when I was using. Uh, you can see the picture that I posted from the using from the, um, the profile. But uh, when we switched to the new Avid product, the SXL, um, I'm pretty much using the preamp now, you know, because the mic, the 58's always got a, a, a sound that's kind of an industry standard, you know, and um, the proximity of it works well with most singers, you know, the closer you get into it, the more bass you'll add to it, uh, and you can pull out of it and still uh, hear, and uh, it, it takes a lot of input pressure, but an SBL, but uh, I, I'm just using a preamp and a lot of reverb for Gary, you know, and it, it, the mic is really kind of his sound, you, you know, it's... Um, I just try to, I try to keep it simple, you know? That's cool. What, uh, what type of mix does Gary like in his ears as far as in pertaining to the, his vocals and the rest of the band? Um, he has basically a front of house mix with the, um, with his vocals up there pretty hot so he can hear himself. Of course he always, like I am right now, he has one ear kind of cracked open cause he likes the interaction with the audience. So, um, but yeah, it's basically like a front of house mix with all the effects and stuff like that. Now his vocal is a lot more wet compared to what John would be doing at front of house. There's a lot of reverb. It's like when we go into award shows, I'll tell the house guy that's dialing it up there. Um, I said, just put it on a hall with about two and a half seconds of decay on it and give him a lot of it. Cause he likes it. He likes to feel like he's standing in a, in a stadium everywhere he goes, you know, he likes that feel. That's great. Yeah, I, I know a lot of people who like to have that big, big hall sound in their ear mix, and uh, it's great that the 58 gives you enough separation to be able to create that. So it's really yeah. cool. Um, talk about where you might have used 58 on something other than vocals, other applications you guys might have tried it on. Oh, man, I've used it on guitars. I mean... When, when I was starting out, we kind of used it on anything and everything because it was it was what we had, you know. Um, used it on drums, snare drum. It was worked really well. Um, like I said, mostly I put it in front of guitar amps, put it in front of snare drums, um, put it on a kick drum. Um, kind of tried it all around, you know. Um, it's it, it never sounds bad with anything. Uh, it's not always the first choice for drums or anything like that, but it always works and you always know what you're going to get. I'm sorry. What was the question? That's great. Um, oh, goals. Oh, on stuff we've used it on. <laughs> like John said, I've used it on snare drums, guitar amps. Yeah. Uh, I've stuck it in a kick drum before that, you know, as, as funny as it actually really bad, it was a really bad sounding kick drum. So I, uh, with the proximity of getting into the microphone, we just stuck it right outside the hole of the kick drum head and it 
added some low end to the drum. Yeah, I've used one right by the batter on a kick drum too, and it, it definitely added some presence. You know, as a, as a second yeah. mic, it was really great. That's cool. Uh, I understand there's a modified fishing net on the side of the stage. <laughs> so uh, maybe yeah. you can talk to me a little bit about that and uh, and why that's there, Stuart. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's funny because I've been watching some of the YouTube comments and people are saying uh, how durable the microphone is and that they, they drop it and beat it up and it just keeps on going. You know, it's like you, it's like you can't kill this thing. But um, our singer Gary used to have this thing when he would walk off stage, he would hand the mic to somebody. And over the years, it's it's went from just a handoff to uh, like it started as a little toss just you know just like hey you know here you go and then it got to where it was like he would be standing in front of the drum riser and he would chuck it and someone was catching it but uh over the years he gets farther and farther away and now it's become kind of a thing uh you know it went from you know very close from the drum riser to downstage center and now it's gotten pretty much at the encore into the encore he's out on the thrust which is usually it's about 60 to 70 feet um usually um, wow. but so the thing is, is when he tosses this thing, he doesn't really, it's like say monitor world is back over your shoulder here, which it is. He'll just throw it like that and, uh, expect us to catch it. So, uh, I have to stay at the console and John's, you know, we're watching it to mute. Cause otherwise there's, there's <laughs> going to be the loud thump, um, that everybody hears when the mic hits the ground, if we miss it, or when it hits the, the fishing net. But first we used to catch it with our hands or the guy that does our crew chief, Jeremy overall. Um, he used to catch it with his hands, but it, he learned over time that it's, um, you know, Gary's not quite um, Peyton Manning. So uh, he, he, it's it's kind of untelling where the mic's going to end up when he throws it. Um, so he used a fishing net. The first time he used a fishing net, it was going at such high velocity, it just went straight through the net. So uh, the next day he got a new fishing net and took a whole roll of gaff tape and uh, gaff tape inside of the net and then the outside of the net and made just big giants like, fishing net size catcher's mitt so it's on a long pole so he can catch it wherever and um you know I, it's it's rare that he misses it now but i think we've got video of that somewhere yeah we're, we're about to cue that up here and uh i'll let you know when that's ready but uh yeah the other thing is is uh not only does he have a 58 transmitter but it's also got uh, a different look to it can you talk about why that uh looks different these days uh, yeah, he's uh, Gary's a, his avid. He's an avid sportsman, so he's uh, into the hunting world. And um, he's got uh, he works with a company called Mossy Oak. Uh, they do camouflage patterns for hunting equipment, and they also do this have this process. Um, it's called um, liquid graphics, basically. So there's a place down in Murfreesboro that they dip the mic in um, in the camo pattern. So. You know, the guys down there, they take the mic completely apart and uh, dip every piece, put it all back together and um, reassemble it. And we've got, he's got different patterns, you know, the camouflage patterns that, uh, so I've got two mics of most patterns that's popular at the time. You know, it's like, there's a, there's a fishing pattern, two fishing patterns we have a, uh, it's called a blind or a hunting blind pattern. And then there's one like a, a kind of a deep woods pattern, but it's all camouflage patterns uh, that they dip. It's an interesting process. Oh, well, cool. That's it sounds awesome. really transparent. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> well, I think uh, I've got Jason uh, standing by with the video queued up, and I'll probably have him share his screen so we can check that out real quick. All right. I think uh, I think everybody can see this here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hit play. This wasn't the format we were going to play it in, so it might be a little choppy, but we're going to give this one a shot, see if we can, uh, you can see the fishing net there, uh, that guy's holding, we're going to get a little bass throw and then a little mic throw right afterwards. So here we go. There it is. <laughs> that's awesome gotta love that definitely well uh what are what other things uh, would you guys like to uh discuss about the 58 in general um 
you know, any particular someone's favorite asking stories? On the, someone's asking on, on the YouTube chat. I'm not sure if you can kill a deer with it, but if you get close enough, I bet you could beat it with it pretty hard, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know you could drive nails with it, you know, with the 58. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, cool. But it, it, it's it's super durable microphone, you know, it's uh, the windscreen. I wish I had the windscreens, but usually they're so damaged, I just toss them in the trash. But as soon as we get some, once we start touring again after this whole uh, pandemic, so we're all, I'll send you guys some... Uh, some uh, examples of, of how bad they get dented. It's like I ask uh, the guy catching uh, Jeremy that's catching the microphone with the fishing nets. Uh, I called him this morning and said, "Hey, do we have? Do you know if we have any of those around? I don't. I can't find any of the damaged ones." He goes, "Well, just take a brand new one and beat it with a hammer, and it'll look about the same." <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, I started back in artist about 25 years ago or so and we used to get a shipment in uh periodically of mics from the green day tour and uh they, they were buying all their 58s but we made a deal with them to swap out the grills and it was pretty funny to open that box and you'd pick one up and oh my goodness look at that what in the world did he do to that and it was like flattened on the top and most of them we were able to unscrew the grills and most of them were still working and just put new grills on them, boxed them up, sent them back out on the tour. It was a pretty fun day, though. It was, it's almost like somebody stuck it in a microwave for 10 minutes or something like that, and this grill just disintegrated into <laughs> nothing, or, you know, it got stomped on by 10 elephants or something like that. But <laughs> it was pretty awesome to, to open that box. So, well, I really yeah, appreciate you guys. Good. Hey, I, I do want to add one thing because I saw a comment from uh, Brian P on the thread on the YouTube thread. Brian P said the the what was he said the uh, the the head is durable, the capsule is durable. I'd the wireless circuits. I would it's the wireless circuit I would worry about. But uh, Brian, you don't have to worry about that circuit. Uh, I mean, we've had this thing bounce off cases, roll down, and get roll off a stage into mud, and the thing is, is I. I wish I could video every time this happens. Is I, every time we pick up that microphone, we just take the capsule off, still working. The wireless still works. Um, the capsule still working. It's rare that, that the, it's rare that the actual wireless itself too, uh, and here's a kudos to Shure and their product development and engineers with their wireless microphone is, is, is you can drop that thing. It's not good for it, but uh, we've never had a wireless not work the next day. I use that same, we've got two mics and it's rare that I have to send one in to get it fixed. That's great. John, any stories you got want to share? Oh, uh, well, I mean, honestly, as far as with, with flats, it's like, like you said, it, we kind of use the same one all the time. You know, we'll, we'll swap them out. Um, if they start to sound a little, you know, the mid range will lack a little bit, but it, I mean, it really takes, I mean, we might do that once through a whole tour, if, if at all, you know, typically, typically they sound good. He doesn't, he doesn't sweat into them anything like, like Henry does. Um, but, you know, they, they, uh, they really stand up and, and we rarely have to go to that spare. Um, you know, I, we've, we just keep using them and they, uh, they sound great. That's awesome. Well, cool. Well, uh, I think we're going to jump over to our uh, Q&A section here. And, uh, bef but before we do that, of course, thank you guys for your time today. Please stick around if we have any questions for you. And, uh, and yeah, so uh, I think I'll bring Jason back in. Hello, What's there up? he is. Yeah. Back again. Doing, hey, buddy? nice shirt, Ryan. I like you it. You know, the memo. I mean, <laughs> the memo between <laughs> us went out, right? <laughs> Absolutely did. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Excellent. Um, great guys. So we've, we've, uh, been monitoring the chat, trying to pull some of those questions out that, uh, we weren't getting to answer right away. Um, so we're going to go to, to back to some of those. If you guys have some questions you'd like to have answered, go ahead and throw them in the chat. We're going to do our best to get to all of them. We're up here about uh, 18 minutes or so before this thing is supposed to end, but we'll do our best to answer all the questions you guys throw at us here. Uh, Stuart and John, thanks for doing some of that on your own. Uh, that was awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let me see if I can pull up some of the questions we got earlier on. And uh, I would invite um, any of the, the panelists that are still on or in the background. We've got quite a team back here uh, running this thing to jump in and, and fire away some answers as you guys see fit. Um, 
So one of the first ones we had, um, and I believe Michael Pedersen had the answer for this earlier, is how many total SM58s have been made? Well, hi guys. Um, first of all, we actually don't have an accurate count because those things get lost over the years. Uh, second of all, we're a private company and we don't really reveal that. But I can tell you that we hit SM58 1 million sometime in the 1990s. So you can extrapolate out from there. Wow. 2020, sometime in the 1990s, we hit a million. Is that what yeah. you said? Yeah. That's impressive. That's a whole lot of 58s out there. Yep. It's amazing to me because they never break. But yeah, I mean, I've, 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 got, I've got mine from 1970. I'm like, I don't, I don't know where they're all going. What a business model. <laughs> Eventually, everybody in the world is going to have one. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, great. Well, thanks, Michael, for jumping yep. on and answering that. Uh, I, the question here, uh, maybe John Bourne, if you're sticking around here, it might be good for you. Uh, what is the fuzzy stuff on the diaphragm? And maybe what's the purpose of that? I, I imagine that's the... Um, inside of the inside of the capsule he's talking about yeah uh so that fuzzy stuff is actually just kind of a um uh ingress protection barrier yeah it, it helps with pop protection a little bit um to help reduce wind noise and plosives but it also the main thing is just to make sure nothing goes down those holes into into the diaphragm so uh it's part of the pop filtering and it's also part of just ingress protection and particle protection from hitting the diaphragm underneath that part uh, that's the resonator cap, which helps lift the uh, top end of the microphone. Awesome. 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 Um, all right, moving on. Hey, where is the SM58 manufactured? Anybody? That should be a John question. John, you still there? I am still here. Where where is it made? Is that what you said? Where is it manufactured? Yeah, where is yeah. the SM58 manufactured? We yeah. manufacture in, in two locations at Sure, uh, in Mexico and also in our facility in China. Nice. Uh, and just a note, I don't know that we covered this earlier. Most of those slides with with John Bourne earlier of the validation labs and stuff, that is all still done at our headquarters in Chicago. Yes, all of uh, our R and D and research and development and engineering uh, is done in uh, in our Niles location. And just outside Chicago. Yeah, absolutely. And John, yeah. also important just to know that the, the facility in, in Mexico and the facility in China, those are sure owned facilities. Those are sure associates. You know, it's not like outsource. It's all just people working for sure, just in different countries. That that is exactly right. They're all of them are our employees and at sure.com email addresses. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Very cool. Awesome. Um, earlier, we had a, a comment and a question, kind of a wishful thinking thing. They said, uh, it would be great if you could make a wired uh, 58 version that the capsule could be removed so you could just replace the capsule. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, not long ago, uh, Sure introduced a product called the VPH, which is a video production handheld, and I happen to have one here. Uh, the VPH is a basically a hardwired stick with an XLR connection on the bottom that has the threaded capsule top on it. So if you wanted to, you could take all of the capsules that we make that are threaded capable and take a 58 and screw that onto this VPH hand mic. And voila, you have yourself a hardwired SM58 with a changeable capsule on the top. Um, and John, pretty flexible. You could, you, John, you can still buy replacement capsules, right? For the top, for... Mr. Bourne? I think I'm pretty certain you can. Yes. Yeah. So you basically, oh, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You unscrew the top, unsolder some wires, put it back in. Now keep in mind, the capsule is probably eighty percent the, the the price of the microphone. So you're going to pay close to what a, you know a new microphone is because that's where all the work is. But you can replace them. Got to know how to solder. Not you know, so so many people don't know how to solder anymore. So awesome, awesome, good to know. So you can solder a new one on, or you can grab yourself a VPH and swap them out uh, at will. Thanks, Michael Patterson. Um, uh, had a couple questions. I know we answered this in the chat earlier, but I figured I'd address it on the uh, on the webinar here. Uh, what preamps are guests and panelists using? The 58s sound so great. Interfaces. I have a lovely Sure MVI that I'm plugged into. And it's plugged into my laptop. Sorry, I'm talking too close into the microphone now. But, yep, I'm going through the MVI. Thanks to Nicholas who sent us one here. So, appreciate that, buddy. 
I think almost all of us are on a wait, 58 through wait. an MVI. I've uh, got a, uh, a oh, bit of an X2U, right. here. I've got an X2U, everybody. Wow. Yeah. Uh-huh. All right. And, uh, and John, what did you have up there? It's a, it's a little Behringer that I have for my fly dates, uh, a UMC 202 HD. And I'm speaking into the 565 HD that you guys so kindly gave us with my name on it. Boy, you can really hear the directionality of yeah, that. Yeah, right. You moving around. <laughs> exactly. That was awesome. Yeah. Don't don't show Henry that. Uh oh. <laughs> exactly. Oh, he's yeah. got the HR right. 58. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. Awesome. Uh, but the majority of us were through a through a Sure MVI, uh, which is a pretty wicked little uh, USB interface and preamp. It's really slick. Yeah, it looks nice. Awesome. Um, so, hey, Michael Patterson, yes. I know we touched on this in your slide deck earlier, but we had another question come through. Whatever happened to the SM59? After, oh, after Sinatra oh man, room. <laughs> that was, that, you know, I mean, you know, every, every company likes to say, oh, we've all, we, everything we do is great. Well, not so much with that one. Uh, it was a flat response mic. So basically it didn't have that presence peak, which people kind of expected out of the Shure microphone. Uh, it had a really good internal shock mount. But uh, the actual microphone inside had a very small diaphragm. So the output level was probably six to eight dB below an SM58 as well. Um, it didn't last very long. The one place you can still see them, the Chicago City Council. They have over 50 of them done in a bronze finish on a custom mount that have been in use since like around 1980. That's the only wow. ones that I've ever seen. Uh, you know, maybe with mid-century modern being a real popular now, the, the look of that microphone has come back, but it was never in my mind, a favorite a micro, a microphone for me as far as the way it looked and the way it sounded. It just sounded dull compared to a 58. So uh, it was gone by probably 1988 or something like that. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, um, is there any way to reshape a dented SM58 windscreen? Yeah, that was that was in my that was in my presentation. Uh, a go to the hardware store and get yourself a wooden hand uh, file handle. And just put it in there and push it out or hammer it out. I'm sure that John and Stu have some ideas as well, but or buy a new one. I mean, what are the eight bucks? <laughs> <laughs> uh, drumsticks and yeah. we use drumsticks and uh, screwdrivers usually. And I found honestly that Craftsman older Craftsman screwdrivers work the best because they have like a it's a like a ball on the end of the uh, screwdriver handle. So you awesome. just take it inside. And somebody in the comments on the YouTube things mentioned that a drumstick as well on a screwdriver and you just beat the dents out of it slowly and just try not to um, let it slide too much on top of the drumstick or the screwdriver or you're going to rip that little um, the, the felt or the foam inside the capsule or the windscreen inside the windscreen get it done anyway fantastic <laughs> um, hey what's the difference between the 565 SD and the SM58 John, you or me? Uh, I'll go, and you can tell me if I'm incorrect. Um, <laughs> As always. How about that? <laughs> um, other uh, acoustically, virtually nothing, um, and mechanically, virtually nothing, other than the closing ring is uh, on the on the 565 is is a plastic black closing ring, and the finish is obviously chrome. Uh, the SM58 is obviously painted black with a painted closing ring and a metal closing ring. Uh, and I believe there's an impedance option in the uh, 565 right. and a switch. Right. Other than that, the guts and the acoustic design and the mechanical design internally are identical to an SM. Yeah, well, openings on the grills are different sizes too. That probably affects the high end just a little bit, I think. Cause... Yeah, the mesh grill right. is a slight, the, the wire mesh is slightly different. Right. That's a good point. That's a real popular mic now because of the Bohemian Rhapsody film. When that came out, all of a sudden the sales on that went through the roof. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I know a lot of sound guys who just get <laughs> there. You go. There it is. Got there you go. There yeah. we do. <laughs> yeah. I know a lot of sound guys just get the 565 because of the switch. It's easy for their talk back voice of God mic. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Fantastic. Uh, while we're talking about differences between mics, what are the differences between a standard 58 and the 50th anniversary edition? Uh, the paint job it's in just the box in the box, right? <laughs> yeah. The paint job in the box. That's it. 
There's the box. There he is. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. yeah. Did, that was like a recreation of the 1960s box, kind of, wasn't it? John? Yeah. The the back text is kind of in the old style. It was. Yeah. We yeah. took it out of the red the red velveteen era of yeah. our of our heritage. Yeah. Paying homage. I love it. Um, is the Super 55 capsule similar to the SM58? No, actually, it is mostly similar to the to the Beta 58. Um, it is a virtually a Beta 58 cartridge inside the Super 55. Um, I say virtually because the cage around the Beta the cage around that cartridge does not exhibit the same properties of a Beta 58 from uh, reflections and acoustics and stuff. But uh, from a pure cartridge standpoint, we basically borrowed a lot of the Beta 58 cartridge and manipulated it to put it inside the Super 55 and then had to kind of tweak it because of the acoustics of that cage around the cartridge, obviously alter the, the effects, so. Awesome. We, uh, we had a question that came in uh, that just after this that said, what, what are the benefits from moving from an SM58 to a Beta 58? So maybe there's a good transition period to this. As arguably our number one question uh, in terms of microphones, uh, the Beta 58 offers uh, a couple of different uh, variances than the SM58 does. The hardened steel grill, so it doesn't dent. It offers a super cardioid pattern, so it has tighter rejection on the sides of the microphone. Um, and the last thing is a hotter output. Uh, it has about five dB hotter output than the SM58 does. So the pattern, the grill, uh, and that the, and the fourth one would be the acoustic response. It is a, a little bit brighter sounding microphone, uh, a little less low end, uh, a little more driving through the mid range. Um, so the tightness of the pattern, the grill, um, the uh, the sound quality, the brightness of the sound quality, and the output. Okay, hey, John, in the in the archive we have one of the original Beta Fifty Eight uh, designs. The chrome, the grill was bright chrome. And yep. instead of that cool blue band around it, it had orange polka dots. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and there are differences between. <laughs> Not kidding. The, there are differences between the original Beta 58 and the Beta 58A. That's a common question we used to get to. The Beta 57 original with the with the steel slotted grill versus the Beta 57A. Um, that's a common question. Yeah, well. when the drummers used to hit that grill, they go bing. <laughs> Yeah, you can you can take that grill and actually the magnetic field around that grill yeah. is so strong you can take it off on the beta fifty seven and it'll attach to the side of the mic. Yeah. You can literally like spin it around like a like a like top. A gate. <laughs> <laughs> Might have to video that one day. Throw yeah. it up there. Um, uh, let's see, just a couple more here. We're we're coming up right on the time, so this is perfect. Uh, does the uh, SM fifty eight use leaded solder? You know. I do know that um, it does not. Uh, uh, we have, there's a constant effort with the Rojas R O H S efforts that go through, and Rojas three, Rojas two actually was a leaded solder. So um, there is not leaded solder or lead in any of our products due to the re government requirements of, of Rojas three and Rojas two. Uh, we awesome. are now going through Rojas four, which is also very exciting from a <laughs> compliance standpoint. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wicked. Uh, hey, John and Stuart, uh, EQ recommendations for the 58. What do you guys use and recommend? Yeah, I, pretty much a high pass it around 160. I cut a little bit of 250. Um, don't really do too much else. You know, de uh, depending on the day, I might do a couple of notches here or there, but um, just more for the room uh, and uh, kind of just tweaking things if, if he's real close to the PA or not. But overall, it's just a little cut at 250. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. My, on the, for in-ears, um, for in-ears, I my high pass is up to 120. Uh, and then I have it's a little bit of boost around two. I, I do the opposite of thinking, John, a little boost of two to 250. But like two, three dB, it's very minimal. Uh, and then I have a cut around, I think, 315 to 400, just a little bit. Uh, and then Gary likes kind of an airy kind of sibilance on the mic. So um, there's I put a shelf on it from 3,000 up, uh, and then that's about 2 to 3 dB as well. I'm not doing a whole lot of EQing on it at all, really. Awesome. 
Awesome. Awesome. Um, Hey, Patterson, what, uh, what headphones are those? Oh, these are 50. I can never remember the model number. Let me look, let me take it off and look. These are the what, 1540s, right? Is that right? That's, that's what was spotted. <laughs> and they, the question was, are those the 1540s? Yes. So yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the viewer over there nailed it on the head. Yeah, well I, 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 I love them. They're really comfortable. They sound great. They're just super. Fantastic, guys. Well, we are right up here against our five o'clock time. I think we got to most of the questions I saw posted through there. Um, obviously, one giant big more thank you to our guests uh, for being here. And uh, we do have our final prize drawing to get through. Oh, yeah. So uh, let me pull up here this the, the list of winners that have been sent to me. Uh, God, I, I hope am not I picking win. the winners. <laughs> Somebody's feeding them to me from a random prize <laughs> location. Corey, I don't know if you're eligible, unfortunately. Corey from Oak Forest, Illinois, Jason. There it is. <laughs> Nailed it. Um, all right. So this is for the four SM58 50th anniversary edition microphones, the ones we just showed you that were a little bit different. And we have our, ant our uh, winners that just came in. Uh, the first winner of this is Doug McLeod from, oh boy, Canandaigua, New York, is what that looks like to me. Fantastic. Congrats, Doug. Uh, second one's going to be Elizabeth Dershberger from Lancaster, New York. Third winner is Mitch Gurowitz from Piscataway, New Jersey. Man, pronunciation in these winners. And uh, our final 50th anniversary edition winner and the final SM58 winner from our 58th day is Brian Latocha from Ridley Park, Pennsylvania. Uh, cool. As mentioned earlier, we will reach out to you guys via email get your shipping information and get you all your fantastic prizes. Excellent. Well, yeah, I'd like to uh, thank everyone as well. Um, and uh, a big thank you to Henry Rollins and our guests, John and Stuart from Rascal Flats. And of course, uh, people behind the scenes, Mr. Michael Pedersen and uh, John Bourne for coming on board to uh, share their uh, knowledge. And then uh, Corey for, running the interview with Henry Rollins and my buddy Jason there for doing the, uh, the uh, giveaways and all that and, and the questions and also running, uh, running the webinar today for us, Nicholas, Mark, and Salino. We really appreciate your guys' help on all this. Um, speaking of webinars, uh, we're going to throw up a slide here of some upcoming webinars that uh, you can attend. And uh, we've got some... Uh, Trying. There we go. All right. Here we go. Yep. So uh, these are awesome events that we put on on Fridays in May here. Coming up next week, we've got May 15th is all about battery workflow. And then on the 22nd, we'll be talking about show link. And on the 29th, we'll be talking about mic capsules. And we have some amazing guests for each one of those seminars. Um, you'll see Jason on those and and as well as Jen and Ben Escobedo. So uh, we hope you can tune into those webinars. You're going to learn a lot and you're going to talk with some amazing pro people out there in the world who are loving using these this technology. So also we have our pro tech talks uh, every first and third Tuesday of the month. So and you can see our hosts there from our market development pro team. So. Uh, be sure to tune in there. We always post when we're going to have those, and uh, you can sign up to uh, get a link to, to log into those. So, uh, And I think that's about it for today. Again, thank you to everyone for joining us on SM58 Day, and we hope you have a wonderful SM58 kind of weekend. So thanks again. Thanks, guys. Have a good weekend. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, John. Thanks, Stu. Legend, icon, the industry standard for over 40 years, the Shure SM58 professional vocal microphone could certainly coast on its reputation. But this is one legend whose story is still being written. Night after night, stage after stage, session after session, 
There's a reason the SM58 continues to be used, abused, trusted, and beloved by music industry giants the world over. In fact, there are a lot of reasons. It starts with the technology. Shure invented it and continues to perfect it. Every unidirectional dynamic microphone that's followed the SM58 utilizes the same core components. But only the SM58 is hand-assembled to Shure's rigorous specifications. Its bass roll-off and brighten mid-range help your voice cut through the mix. A consistent cardioid polar pattern minimizes background noise and reduces the possibility of feedback. And its custom-designed pneumatic shock mount virtually eliminates stage vibration and handling noise. So the only thing that comes through the SM58 is your voice. Clear and true. But sound quality is only part of the SM58 story. Its tank-like toughness is the stuff to make roadies wax poetic. Built to military specs, the SM58 has been subjected to the sort of abuse that'll make Armageddon seem like just another day at the office. And it always keeps performing. It may end up with a dented grill, but that's by design. The grill acts as a crumple zone, protecting the cartridge inside without affecting the sound. And dented grills can always be replaced, or brandished with pride, like old battle scars. It's no wonder countless artists from across the musical landscape, from up-and-comers to bona fide superstars, trust one mic and one mic only. It's no wonder the legend of the SM58 just keeps on growing. For more information, visit Shure.com.